Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today on this beautiful Saturday afternoon to talk about some of these uh, very important issues. So I'd like to start out by having the uh, panelists introduce themselves briefly, and I'll start with an introduction for of myself. I'm uh, Carla McMillan. I'm a justice on the Georgia Supreme Court. But for this event, I think it's more important that I actually grew up in a Chinese community in Augusta. Uh, Crystal and I are cousins, so many of the interviewees that you saw are people that I grew up with. Are, 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 many of them are my family members, so um, this is a very personal project to me as well. So, if panelists, if you could introduce yourself. Well, good afternoon. It is a joy to be with you all this afternoon. Wait, 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 I'm Dr. Adria Welcher. I'm an associate professor and the chair of the Department of Sociology at Morehouse College, as well as the director of general education. I, too, am from Augusta. Now, I didn't have any family members in the video, but I did. There were some very familiar names, people with whom I've known for many, many years. So this story was very personal to me because I was able to take my sociological hat onto something that I didn't understand as a child, these sort of interpersonal relationships um, and how they relate to the structure. So very, very excited to engage with you today. Thank you. Okay, so I guess you know I'm Crystal and I'm Carla's cousin. And I didn't know that until I started embarking on this project, which is crazy. What's even crazier is my other cousin, who's just, I just realized is in the audience, Leanne, who's in the film, is somebody I didn't even know existed. Uh, because of these erasures of histories for whatever reason. So, Leanna, thank you for being here. Um, so, as, as I, you know, I'm not gonna say too much now, but I, I live in Hawaii, I have three kids um, who grew, grew up and were born in Hong Kong, so I come from a transnational perspective on these race issues because it's not just a, a, a southern issue. It is a global international issue of colorism and race relations that we need to address here. So I'm so just privileged to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Al Vivian. I am the president and CEO of Basic Diversity. We are the nation's longest serving diversity consulting firm. Uh, we do work all over, but we're best known for our two-day race seminar, which has been evaluated as the most effective race relations seminar in existence. Uh, 86 to 94 percent effectiveness. Great, thank you for the introduction. So I think it's a good discussion. Um, the first question is for Crystal. Um, you alluded to this in your uh, in your previous introduction, but this project took you many years to complete and started with a very different focus. Can you share a little bit about the backstory and tell us how this project turned into an exploration of a relationship between the African American and Chinese American community? Sure, I'll try to keep that simple and short and sweet, but you know, I was very close to my grandmother and it came from a very personal place. I had intentions of just doing a story about these unruly Chinese women in the South who resisted structures. That was the original title of my film, by the way, Unruly Chinese Women. Um, but um, as I progressed in the, the uh, editing of it, uh, Black Lives Matter happened, right? And so it really uh, shifted me off course, and I realized there was a larger force I needed to embrace and, and confront. And uh, But then in that process, I felt like I was losing my voice. I, I come from a point where I love to situate the women's stories, and how does uh, a woman's lens speak to the uh, racism and the Black Lives Matter situation, but lo and behold, the anti-Asian rape anti-Asian hate crimes surfaced, right? So I'm grappling with a couple of very large movements that have shifted our narrative around racism. And so, uh, to your point, Carla, is I had to pull back the personal stories and it morphed into what it is today. And um, I, if, if it didn't, I guess we wouldn't be here today to talk about these issues. And how does a small uh, story of these untold histories uh, speak to a larger truth that we're all grappling with today is something that I think is important to recognize. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, Adrian, let's follow up on that. The film exposes a lot of prejudice held by the uh, Chinese community against African Americans, um, even though the communities live side by side in Augusta. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, nowadays people like to argue that they're not prejudiced because they don't see color. They're colorblind. Um, and they treat everybody the same. But being colorblind can actually be counterproductive. So can you elaborate a little bit about that? Gladly. Thank you. <laughs> 
So when we say colorblind, it sounds really good, right? It's the idea that I don't see color, so I can't be prejudiced towards you, or I cannot discriminate against you. When in actuality, if we don't see color, we're denying who you are. Because when you walk into a room, I size you up, right? So we can look at it from a psychological perspective and schemas and how we make sense of the world, or we can look at it, at it from a sociological perspective, right? But when you walk into a room, I make a series of assumptions about you based on your phenotype. Inherent in that phenotype is your color. So for us to say that I am colorblind is really dishonoring the heritage, all of the culture and the value and the beauty that you bring into a room with you. So it's better for us to understand that by saying that we're colorblind, it's really problematic because then I don't see you. So it's, it's, the, it's the opposite of what we think it says, right? And I'm trying to just, you know, it's a little dark out there, so I'm trying, I'm teaching you all, I can teach my class, I need to see the nods, I need, you know, in, in the African American tradition, the call and response, I need to hear, yes, you know, or nods. Thank you. So with that in mind, we have to be very mindful that when we see the color, we don't make the assumptions then that lead to the prejudiced and discriminatory behavior, right? So it's not about seeing color, it's about what we do with that color when we see it, right? Yeah. Al, in the film, um, several African American interviewees talked about how they felt that the Chinese were trying to align themselves with the white community. And there was a tension, there's definitely a tension there. So in your opinion, and based on your research and your work that you've done, is this a prevalent view among African Americans today? And how do African Americans view Asian Americans today? As friends or foes? As a stereotypical model minority? Or something else? Hard question. I guess if I were to choose one of those categories, I would say or something else. Uh, not necessarily friend or foe. Uh, but definitely uh, more privileged uh, than we are, past and present. And so uh, something the African American community has always been really good at uh, because on that color hierarchy, we were always seen as at the bottom because in, in America and throughout the world, the darker you are, the worse you tend to get treated. Uh, and so as a result, uh, we are pretty good at sizing people up. So we, we look at different groups and try to figure out where do they picture us, and that determines how we view them. Uh, and so the, the privilege piece, you know, as, as Crystal just clearly made real obvious in the movie, which was really great, and that is that uh, they have, Asians have privileges that we didn't. You know, they, could, they could still go to the, to the white schools, they could still drink from the white water fountains, so they were allowed a much better education and other things that we were not allowed to have. So, we see, we see the Asian community as different. Uh, and so we're always trying to figure out where do we fit with them and where do they fit with us. Yeah, great. So the, the next question is for Crystal. And um, this film it, it really started as an exploration of Chinese women, unruly Chinese women. But now the film also talks about race and gender and how your grandmother and her sisters were forced to marry other Chinese and were prohibited from fraternizing with African Americans, much less marry them. Uh, but on the other hand, the Chinese families were, had maids in the house, African American maids in the house. Um, Based on your, your research, where does this racism and gender bias come from, and how do those negative attitudes get reinforced? Oh, I get the hard question. <laughs> All these questions are hard. <laughs> well, I'm not a history expert. I know some of you are in the audience, but I can, based on my research and what I've seen is, and to speak to the term blurring, because I think that we need to entangle. It's not just one thing or the other, right? You you have to complicate it by um, including the ideas of gender, um, race, class, and all of that. It, it's all part of the same kind of complex fabric of what this country's built on. And to speak to that, I think that's where it comes from. You know, how was racism built? I mean, race, as you learn in school, is a construct. But what does that really mean? It, you know, it means that somebody created this idea of this white power in the central, and everything that's not that is othered. And that's everyone else. And, and then it puts us all against each other. Um, and defining, again, to your point about the, the, the colorism and, and the uh, proximity to whiteness and why everything is gauged around what's defined in the middle. And 
I, I feel like that's where the whole structure, you know, and I don't want to go into that, but um, one person, that I, I, I screened my film in Hong Kong, and one lady says, well, where are the white people in your film? You're talking about this relationship between uh, black and white, and so where? And my argument for that is that it is the premise of my film. If I didn't have this white central power that existed, we wouldn't have these conversations today. And so it is everything. It's not the shark in the water, it's the water, and we need to talk about that. Yeah, thank you. And just following up on that, Adria, you've done a lot of research into race and class inequalities, and that was alluded to in the film, too. The, the anti-miscegenation laws, the segregated schools. I mean, there was a lot of in the legal background during the segregated South that contributed to the divide of the Asian American and African American communities. Can you discuss that a little bit more? And particularly, if you could talk about segregated schools and how Augusta was not the norm necessarily with that. Um, please. Absolutely. Now, I, I will also give the disclaimer that I am a sociologist, not a historian or a political scientist, but I am familiar with a number of these laws. And so just, just allow me a, a little bit of levity here. So when we think about sort of nationally, right, there was a, a, a wave of Chinese immigration to the United States as a part of the gold rush. Right, under this notion of, hey, we're coming in search of getting money, hitting the jackpot, right? So we often think of this sort of Western sort of influx of Chinese Americans, right? Well, as folks were coming initially, it was received as a positive thing, right? Because well, we need as many people to go and find this gold. But eventually, it became a threat to this white power structure, right? And so the way that we speak about it sociologically is ethnic competition theory, right? So the more ethnic groups that are here, we're all competing for the same spaces. Right, because we have the whites who are sort of in the middle, as you mentioned earlier, Crystal, like they're, they're the, the norm, right? But everybody else is competing to be in second place, right? Or maybe third place, or maybe, maybe at some point we can get close enough to be first place, right? So this notion that as Chinese came, at first it was a good thing, Chinese and other Asian immigrants as well, right? But it, it was, and, and let me also pause there. When we look at this sort of Asian story, we have to be very mindful to not talk about it as a pan-ethnic story. Because every country has its own history, its own reason for immigration, who was allowed to come, who was prevented from coming. So when we look at the Chinese experience, they came with the gold rush. Initially it was good. Then the women were not allowed to continue to come into the country, right? Because Chinese women had been hypersexualized, they were perceived as bad people. So, but the men are still here. And, and linked to that, we have these anti-miscegenation laws that says, well, Chinese men, you can't marry non-Asian folks. So we see Chinese men intermingling with other Asians, but it was illegal by law to mingle with non-Asian folks. Right? So just, I'm sort of trying to build the history. So the Page Act, which is what prevented the women from immigrating into the country, was shortly followed by the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that was, and it's, it's interesting because we're seeing some vestiges of this today, right? That limited immigration into the country. Now, mind you, none of this was happening with European countries. None of this was happening with European countries. So it wasn't about, whoa, we are full, there's no room. It was about, we are full for people like you, right? And that's a very important distinction to make, right? And so then shortly after, we have the Scott Act that said, well, if you're here and you leave, you can't come back, right? So all of these, this national legislation led to folks really fighting for space, fighting for competition, fighting to proliferate, to, to, to allow their families to grow and live. And I think it's extremely important that we understand the structural nature of this discrimination. This is legislation that we're talking about. It's not somebody just calling up their homeboy and saying, hey, I think we ought to close the gates, right? These are policies that are put in place. And they're put in place intentionally. So the second part of your question that I think is very important is that the way that it was handled in Augusta was unique. Because in most cases, Chinese were not allowed into white spaces as freely back then. Now, of course, it's different, right, over time. But the fact that the Chinese students were in, allowed to attend white schools in, in this segregated economy was very unique. Now, I mean, just think about it, and they talked about it, and it's funny because I actually graduated from Davidson Fine Arts High School, and, you know, and, and, and my brother went to C.T. Walker. So when he saw, I don't know where those schools are, yeah, I'd leave there. But it was living in the black community, 
driving through your community to go to these white schools. So that was very unique because in most cases, the Chinese and, and most immigrants, right, who were not Anglo-Saxon immigrants, most immigrants had this sort of experience where they were not invited into the white space. Even the Jews and the Italians were also in the Absolutely. black Absolutely. That's right. That's right. And, and Irish. Like, we, we, we have countless stories. And if we don't teach this history, which is why I think this conversation is so important, they're not necessarily teaching it in schools. Particularly where there's an attack now on taking out this sort of accurate and appropriate history. They're not teaching it. So these conversations are critically important to ensure that we, one, have the truth, and then two, that we tell the truth. So I hope that I answered that and didn't take too long. But no. <laughs> because I think a lot of Asian Americans don't appreciate that um, their Asian Americans were not allowed to go into the white schools in the rest of the South, pretty much. In Mississippi, there was a fa famous case that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. There was a Mississippi law that prohibited Chinese children, Asian children, from attending the white schools. It was challenged by a Chinese family, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, a case called Gong, Gong Lum versus Rice in 1927. And the U.S. Supreme Court, now mind you, this is 1927, way after Plessy versus Ferguson. And the U.S. Supreme Court cited Plessy versus Ferguson and said, nope, the Asians are prohibited, can be prohibited from going to the white schools, separate but equal. So, I mean, it's, it's just something that is not really talked about today. So thank you so much for sharing, Adria. Uh, going to the next question, uh, Al, uh, the laws have changed, thankfully, uh, but Asian Americans and African Americans continue to be underrepresented in positions of power and authority, for example, corporate boards, judges, uh, and similar positions. So what's it going to take to get Asian Americans uh, a seat at the table? Are there enough seats at the table, and do we have to, are we going to be competing and getting pitted against one another? Uh, for that privilege. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so we've always been pitted against each other from, from the dawn of time. Uh, and that is also by design, and it was also done with policy and with law to make sure it stayed that way, which is why it's still that way. And so when you mentioned the piece about uh, the, the, the laws and policies, and we're still seeing some of that now, I mean, that is now the, the, the attack on schools teaching real history, because I always say we don't get taught American history, we get taught American mythology. Uh, we, don't, we don't get the reality of, of who we are, because if we, start, if we were to start to teach that, then the next generation could see it coming when it came again, but because they don't get taught that, they don't see it coming, so it's just repackaged doing the same thing. So the laws have always been changed, they continue to change. I would also add the piece, uh, and I might get your question off, because I, I love the question, there's so many pieces to it. Um, the, the pitting against each other, uh, the laws always changing. Um, oh, come on, what else did you ask me about? I'm, I'm having a brain cramp. What's it going to take to get Asian Americans to get a seat at the table? Thank you. Forcefulness. Um, I, you know, the, 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 the polite, take it easy, avoid it, uh, that was semi-successful in the past, but I don't think that's going to work for the future. Uh, the beauty is, I think the younger Asian generation gets that uh, and are more willing to push a little bit, as I think that they should. Uh, every, every people deserve a voice in the society, and they, they've not had a voice. Uh, none of us have really had a voice, but, but uh, our numbers were larger. Uh, Asians' numbers are growing faster, but still the, the, the smaller of the groups. But I think that uh, they're going to start pushing more and more, and I think that's needed to happen. And there are always enough seats at the table. Well, I don't know. There might not be enough, but I think you create your own table if you don't have that seat. Because why should you go? You're not giving voices the system. Like, okay, you can come to my table. But we, I think we have to dismantle that idea of who's, who has a table. You know, it's about reframing how we sit. I don't, I don't think it's either or. I think it's an and both. Uh, we should have. We should create our own seats at their table. We should create our own tables because we should. Not, none of us should be limited. In a nation that says we're all entitled to the same rights and freedoms, we shouldn't have to wait our turn. We shouldn't have to beg to get a seat. We should be able to take that seat if we have the ability to get that seat. And, and if we really were a true democracy, it would have already happened. You know, we, we would look like the Democratic Congress. Yeah, I just want to echo that because I wouldn't be in this position today that I'm in if I didn't 
put myself out there. And the thing is, I mean, it, you know, I, I am, I, I was the first Asian American to be elected to statewide office in Georgia. The first one, which is great for me, but why did it take till 2014 for that to happen? Carly, can you share a little bit, I know this may be off topic, but the fact that we are cousins from our grandmother, great-grandmother, you mentioned earlier about this, this interesting distinction about how we go from our past and how the mothers instill certain uh, values that contribute to how we, what our version of success is. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So just our, the relationship between Crystal and I are, Crystal's great-grandmother and my grandmother were sisters. So we're cousins um, on two different lines. Uh, Crystal's family, they married their daughters off. There was really a, a gender segregation in, within that family. My family was very different. Uh, my Aunt Margaret um, was encouraged to go to college by my grandmother, who's a sister to Crystal's great-grandmother. Encouraged to go to college. She went to Mercer University. Encouraged to go to medical school went to MCG and graduated uh, from MCG in 1946 and was the first Chinese American woman to graduate with an MD in the Southeast. I mean, very different. And my guys love in bad marriages. <laughs> from, from the same family. And so I, we, Crystal and I talked about why there was such a difference. And I know that Crystal's great grandmother, I think was the older sister. My grandmother was the younger sister. I don't know if there was any difference in how they were raised. I think there was somewhat of an age difference. Um, but still, very different paths that our families took in terms of how they treated their daughters. And I, I'm the result of that today. I, I really believe I am. So the next question is for Crystal and Adria. Um, Dr. King famously said that it, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Yeah. In the film, Crystal references the First Baptist Church of Augusta, which, by the way, was my home church. I, was, uh, I grew up in that church. That church supported the Chinese community and protected the Chinese in a way. On the other hand, Adria, you're very familiar with that church and the racist views that that, that church took against the African American community. Can you each discuss how religion has been used to divide our communities in the past and today? I'm going to let you take the hard one. I just, <laughs> no, not me, not me. But I just wanted to mention that scene in the film was probably, in my opinion, one of the most uncomfortable scenes. And it's not because of what they say, it's what they don't say. Right? The subtle lot, and I heard it in the audience. There was some feedback on that, and, and that just said so much. Right? I don't have to explain that. I think it was shown itself, so please understand. <laughs> well, I would say um, most First Baptists <laughs> in the South were very racist spaces. I want to say that. And, and as a sidebar, my husband is now the pastor of a First Baptist <laughs> that was white. It is no longer. Everybody's welcome, of course. <laughs> but it's no longer a white church. So First Baptist Church of Augusta is the home of the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, if you know the history, and, and I'm not a theologian, so you all just work with me, the Southern Baptist Convention was created in response to, in, to, to, to integration, right? So the idea that if you are a slave owner, you will be able, or a proponent of, of, de, of de, if you're a proponent of segregation, excuse me, you will be able to assume leadership in this conference. So that's why the Southern Baptist Convention was created, because they supported the segregation. So First Baptist Church of Augusta, the one that we just saw in the video that was so loving and welcoming, according to them, to the Chinese Americans, right, was the exact same place. Now, and you know, Southern Baptist has made history recently for some other unsavory things. Right? But we're talking about a place that was created to support segregation, to support the disenfranchisement of black people. Mm -hmm. Right? And so when you look at that history, if you were just to listen, right, to not take the sounds from the crowd, to not sort of ask the deeper question and do a deeper dive, but oh, so they're welcoming this group, yet they're creating organizations that will keep us out. 
Right, and then of course historically, and, and I don't know that this would be documented, we'd really have to get some historians to go through some primary documents to get this information, but historically the same folks who were leaders at First Baptist Church of Augusta were leaders in the government of Augusta, they were leaders on the school boards of Augusta, they were making other decisions that impacted the livelihood of all the communities, not excluding the African American community. So when I saw that in the video, and this sort of happened in our debrief, I was like, well, that's very interesting because that's not how they treated the black folks <laughs> in Augusta. But when we're talking about sort of the relationship between these two groups, these institutions are part of that framing. Why is it okay for them to attend and not us? Why is it okay for them to have businesses in our community and not us? And I'll stop there before I get another sign from Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, Crystal? I know we're crap for time, so I'll oh, let you okay. on. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll ask the next question for Alvin. And the next couple questions are really trying to um, bring everything together to how we can apply some of the things that we learned today going forward. So, Al, we've talked a lot about our differences, but can you explain why it's important for Asian Americans to be allies of the African American community and other people of color? Um, what do you What do we stand to lose if we don't, and what are the potential benefits? We stand to lose survival, uh, relevance, uh, uh, and wherewithal if we don't come together. Um, all of us, blacks, Latinos, Asians, Arabs, to include whites, uh, if we don't become inclusive, we'll all become irrelevant. Uh, our demographics are changing so massively that if we do not all learn to coalesce with one another, we're just not going to make it. And, and by the way, the rest of the world will be passing us by as actually they already are, we just haven't realized it. Uh, we're so busy fighting each other that we can't really accomplish it. It took over a decade to get an infrastructure bill passed. I mean, let, just let that sink in. We can't, we can't even fix roads and bridges because we're busy fighting each other over stuff. Yeah. Uh, you but, see the roads in Hawaii. Oh, you see the roads in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see some potholes? You're going to lose some color in, in, in the in Detroit. Where the blue? Where the color? It's, it's gone. But, but it's, it's, it's all of that. We need to be working together. What do we have to gain from that? Um, one, there's power in numbers. Uh, two, uh, we learn from each other. Uh, three, more productivity, more creativity, more innovation. Study after study proves that more diversity creates all of that. Uh, better than, and then all the research has been done in businesses to prove it as well. 60% uh, uh, improvement on decision making, you know, 1.7 times percent improvement on, you, you name it, it's, it's everything improves when we're working together. And those who choose to separate will do some at their own peril. But if we're working together, we have more power in numbers. And that's, that's very important. Thank you. And Crystal and Adria, what ideas or advice would you suggest for promoting black and Asian solidarity? And are solidarity and allyship the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> These are words. I feel like the people who claim allyship or solidarity, it doesn't mean anything unless you take action, but what does it mean to take action? I think that's the harder question. Um, because you just check off that, oh, I have one black friend, does not do it, right? <laughs> um, and in my experience in this process, um, to dig deep, especially, intergen I would say intergenerational conversations are vital. It is something we don't do enough of. We don't even know what our parents and grandparents did 